Well, like Coach said, thanks for coming out. Holiday weekend, and uh, you know, we're glad you're here. And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of things you'll be doing on Memorial Day weekend, but we're, we're glad you're here with us. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, just injury prevention strategies, just things that you can do as a coach. You may already be doing. There may be things that you can just incorporate into your programming in an easy way to kind of touch on some areas that, that might be able to help your athletes out. What we got? All right, I want to thank Ron for putting on this clinic and uh, you know, to all the coaches I've worked with and interacted with and the players, um, you know, I've never created anything. I just feel it. And, you know, there's going to be people we talked to today and people we've seen speak. I'm writing it down and I have a chance to already steal something from all of them. So, and, and that's the beauty of this field. A couple years ago, I saw a, a, a great agility drill and we took it to Georgia to try it out and we, we used it for years. As we're doing it, it's like, well, what do you want to call this thing? Well, the strength coach from Colgate was the one that's talking. It's the Colgate girl. Has been ever since. So that's just kind of how how it works. And I'm, I'm going to steal something from all of it at some point because it's probably better than what I can come up with on my own. To start off, just a little bit about coaching. My, this is my dad. And one of the things he's always told me, because I see him as a great leader, people work to the level expected of them. And so as coaches, Part of our job is to manage expectations. And so if we expect great things from ourselves, from our athletes, that's generally what you're going to get. Okay? If they know what you expect out of them on a daily basis, that's generally what you're going to get. Now, the opposite's true. If you don't expect very much, you're not going to get very much. Okay? So our job is to manage expectations. The expectations we have for the athletes, then the expectations that they have for themselves. And that's that's where you're going to see improvement, and our job is to impact their lives. How can we make them better? Well, one of those ways is to make sure they know we expect them to come. If it's showing up on time, doing what you're supposed to, doing it how you're supposed to, dressing a certain way, that's what we expect. And if they know that ahead of time, you're generally going to have less problems throughout the whole process. And another thing, I'm not sure if he said this, but this is the person where I first saw it. He had a sign in the waiver. People need to know how much you care before they care how much you know. And to me, that's kind of the, the driving philosophy with coaching. You can have the greatest facility, the greatest program, and be the smartest guy in the room. But if athletes don't think you care about them, it doesn't matter. It'll never matter. And so when, you, when the players know, the athletes know, that you're looking out for their best interest, that you care whether or not they get hurt, that you care if they get better, they're going to trust you. And they're going to trust you more than if you're the smartest guy in the room sitting over by himself talking about it. So this is something, like I said, Ron may not have said this, but I attribute it to him because that's where I heard it from first. And I think that's, uh, that's something a lot of us can take with us. You know, the more you care about somebody and the more they know you care, the more they're going to be willing to get back to you. So this little table of contents is some things we're going to touch on. And the first thing that we pretty much have to admit to ourselves is that injuries are going to happen. Uh, the sports we play, the way we play, things are going to happen. And there's always going to be something that you wish you could have gotten back, you know, but there's things you can't help. You know, we've got a basketball player falls on the court, breaks the wrist. Well, you know, there's not a lot you could have done about that problem. But they're fighting for a rebound, they tear a leg, well, maybe there's something Maybe there's something you could have done, and that's always a question you're going to ask yourself. But they happen. And lots of times with the high school kids that are coming up now, they're so much stronger, and they're so much more powerful, and they're so much better trained than they used to be. I know when I, my senior year in high school, I think we had two players on our team that bench pressed 400 pounds. And this is 95. And two years ago when I left Georgia, we had 30-something. I mean, they're just, they're better prepared now at a younger age, and a lot of them don't play as many sports. So they're just playing football, they're just playing basketball. So they spend that other time training, and they get better and bigger and faster. And so lots of times their bodies aren't equipped for it yet. And so they get big and strong. And, and maybe they, you know, we've gotten them stronger than their frame can support. So lots of times injuries are just going to happen. It's our job, your job, my job, to try to eliminate that as much as we can. We want them to spend as little amount of time in the training room as possible, as little time off the court as possible. They don't do anyone any good laying on the table in the training room. 
So, first thing, warm it up. You know, people have different beliefs, and I certainly did. I know when I was playing, my warm up for squats was this. All right, let's go. Just throw some weight on, and we're going to go. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> and I should have been doing it then. Um, but having a good warm up routine, okay? Making sure that the athletes are properly warmed up, and this is an area where you can include a lot of your speed mechanics, uh, things like that, running drills, you know, things like that that you want to incorporate. Uh, maybe you don't have to have a separate time to do speed training. You can incorporate it into your warm-up. That way you can condense your workout and be a little more efficient in all the things that you're trying to do. Jump and rope. It's easy, it's cheap, provided you got enough space. Just skip and rope is something that, that help, help you get warmed up. Dynamic stretches. Something this is pretty much all we do with the Eagles. Um, walking lunges, hand kicks, shuffles, backward lunges. And again, we'll do these for a certain distance, and then we'll finish with 10 yards of sprint mechanics. So they'll hand kick for 10 yards, sprint mechanics for 10. Hurdle walks. We take hurdles out on the field. All right? Guys go under and over the hurdles, working on hip mobility, forwards and backwards. Just trying to open up the hips, make sure the athletes can bend and that they're ready for the things they're getting ready to do at practice or lifting. Uh, band walks. We take the little bursa loops. Put them around their feet or their ankles, knees. Sidewalks, forward, backward. And then they do kicks, forward, backwards, sideways, just to kind of get the hips fired. And then static stretches. Of course, static <coughs> stretches anymore. Most people primarily do them after, after work. Technique, and this is something that, depending on where people train, sometimes they get a lot of technique work, sometimes they don't. Um, right now, where I'm at, the first thing I do is ask the guy where he went to college. And depending on what he says, it's like, oh good, you went to, you went to school, I know you were taught how to lift weights. And it's not just in the lifting, you know, running, drills, all these things are gonna make you more efficient. All these things are gonna make you less prone to injuries if you know how to do things properly. Uh, Olympic lifts, again, like I said, we don't, we, we can't spend as much time on it. So what we need to do is make sure it's right. Okay, instead of trying to do 100 variations, make sure they get the one right. Make sure they power clean right or hang clean or whatever it is that you're doing. Make sure they do it as well as they can. And if they can't, modify it. Because again, we can't spend the time that a lot of people can to, to be experts at this. Uh, plyometric exercises. There's a lot of jumping involved in all these sports and a lot of training that goes along with it. We've got a new toy called an, an OptiJump that you lay on the ground, it's got lasers and it's science -y, but it measures ground contact, but it takes pictures of it. And we're, we're talking out on the field, we've got professional athletes they can jump through the roof, but when it snaps a picture of them when they're jumping, they have the worst jump mechanics in the world. They have the worst landing mechanics you would ever see. You see some of these pictures, you think, how, how did you not hurt yourself? But that's something you can work on, uh, making sure that they understand how to land properly and how to bend and how to absorb force. And then with your auxiliary lifts, you know, it's not something where you just want to send the guy out to the room and say, go do this, that, or the other without knowing exactly how they're doing it. And you can monitor how they're doing it and make sure that they're doing it the way you want it to, there's going to be less likely you know, to get hurt. Spotters and belts. You know, this can't be overstated. Always use spotters. You know. Free weights, dumbbells. You know, this is something that you think is second nature. But people get in there and they get to talking and they're not paying attention and all of a sudden what happens is Southern Cow where that kid drops a bar on his throat and damn near kills him. I mean it's something it doesn't matter until you don't have one. Okay, so that's something that needs to be ingrained in, into people. And, and and that kid had a spot. Alright, but he, he had an open grip and the bar slipped off his hands and it was it was just gone. So it's important that you know the players are mindful while they're working with each other to make sure that their athlete, you know, their, their partner's not dropping weight on themselves. Uh, you know, belts, people feel differently about belts. When I was in college, I wore one all the time. And then I came to realize that my, my core, my low back wasn't as strong as it could be, so I, now I never wear one. When I was in Georgia, we got rid of all the belts. Uh, if 
guys needed to wear them, we would let them. But we would tell all of them, look, don't wear them in a woman's face. Don't wear it when we're doing cleaning. Unless we're going heavy, try to stay away from it. Because people are taught their whole lives, you know, squat down and pick things up with your legs and don't use your back. But what happens is that your, your back never gets strengthened. And so what we started to do, well, again, just back off, don't wear it on the warm-up sets. So you actually have to activate your core and your back to stabilize yourself as you're squatting or as you're pulling. And then if you needed it or a guy has a back issue and needs to wear a belt, fine. But if you don't absolutely have to, don't wear it. Okay? And again, knee wraps, kind of same deal anymore. You know, guys aren't using them. They may use it on max day when we were maxing. But outside of that, we really wouldn't want to encourage it because all it's done is taking a little bit away from them actually getting the strength and developing the strength that we want. And plyometrics, going back to plyometrics. Upper and lower body plyometrics are something that can really be used to fire up the central nervous system. If it's something that you can do as part of your warm up. Lots of times we'll do these before we squat. We'll do some you know, box squat plyos and things like that before we start working out. But again, fire the nervous system, get them ready to go. Plyometrics are like Olympic lifts. They require so much coordination and they're great for power development, but the, the landing is the most important part of it because you're absor absorbing force. All right? It's eccentric loading. And that landing technique, again, watching our athletes, a lot of them are so bad. There's a lot of you know, knee valgus and things like that. And if that's something you can improve upon and, and help those guys learn how to land. Uh, I worked with the gymnastics team in Georgia for years. And, and it was amazing to see these athletes that jump all the time, and land all the time, how bad they were at it when we went to the weight room and actually did you know, fives. And so that's something we had to take some time and kind of back off and work on those landing mechanics just so they wouldn't hurt themselves. You know, a lot of different things you can do to help with this, barefoot running. If you feel like you've got a, a safe place where there's not a lot of rocks and matchbox bars out on the field or something, if you want to do barefoot running, that's something else. Or uneven surfaces. Um, we've always had a sand pit that, that we've used. And if you can change up the surface and the texture of the surface, that's something we always like to use. And that aided us in the joint stabilization. And uh, you know, we had a lot of our low back problems, hamstring problems go away running in the sand. Okay. Again, this being a sport, and, and those athletes, they're not coming to us to be weightlifters. Okay? They're coming to be, use the weight room as a vehicle to be better at whatever their sport is. Okay? You know, them getting great, you know, one rep max is on the bench and squat, you know, that's really only for, for me to feel good about how strong they got but they're not coming to be weightlifters. So we want to make sure that, like with the Olympic lift, it requires a lot out of them. So we want to make sure that they're getting it. So we've got to teach it properly. And this is something that I'm sure everyone does in their program. If you don't, you find a way to start implementing it. Even if it's something, like Coach said, all you want is a triple extension. So even if it's, it's a med ball throw, or a pull, or a high pull, something like that, just so you can get triple extension, that's something that you're going to want to have in your program. You're going to develop coordination, develop power. Okay. Dumbbell exercises. We'll start off, you know, going symmetrically with both arms. Then we may alternate. Then single arm. Not only is this going to be good for your joints, it's also going to be work with the core and stabilization. Being able to lay there and do a single arm dumbbell press, you'd be amazed how hard you have to flex your body to keep it rotating off the bench. Same thing with kettlebells. And again, Full range of motion on all these exercises is crucial. If you spend all your time doing half reps, you're going to open yourself up again. You're not going to be as strong as you could be. The single leg exercises are the same way. Squats, lunges, step ups, all these things help with coordination, help with balance, help with single leg drive. But you need, it's important that the full range of motion is there. Core training. Uh, People attack this a lot of different ways. Um, there's a school of thought that says you know, sit-ups, leg lifts, things like that are a waste of time where we need to plank or do you know, isometric exercises with your abs. And I think there's room for all of it. There's some things you probably want to stay away from, but medicine ball throws. 
partner throws up against the wall. Uh, we've got a pad in our room. Uh, the guys do a lot of twists and throws on bridges. We do a lot of planks. We do a lot of rollouts with bars, and wheels, things like that. Again, something you already have in your room that you can incorporate into your program without a whole lot of trouble. You can program it in where they're doing bar rollouts or things like that, med ball throws, med ball slams. Then again, the single arm dumbbell presses. Okay? That's really going to help stabilize the core as you're, as you're laying there. And then standing presses. Like, like Coach said, all our sports are played standing up. So if we stand up to do overhead presses and pulls and things like that, that's going to help stabilize the core, especially overhead presses, overhead squats, things like that. Right now, particularly in the world of football, concussions are a very hot button issue. Um, for whatever reason, you know, recently, it, it's gotten a lot more attention with lawsuits and people passing away and things like that. But now, so much emphasis is being placed on reducing concussions. Well, people think they have an idea and you hope you have an idea, but you don't really know. Because you don't really know, particularly in football, what the effect of getting hit in the head all the time is going to happen. So, the one thing we can do is try to withstand the whipping motion of the head and the rotational forces that go along with having a football helmet on your head with a face mask that can get turned and, and whip your head. You know, the best thing that we can do as coaches is to straighten the neck. Okay? Like I said, think about the tree blowing in the wind. If you've got a tree with a skinny base and the wind blows, that tree's going to get moved around like your head. If you've got a strong base and a thick base on that tree, it's going to be reduced some. The same wind isn't going to have the same effect. So the same impact from a football standpoint is not going to have the same effect on somebody's head. So if you can do exercises where you resist rotation, where you have a strong neck flexion and extension. That's something that I believe will reduce the incidences of concussions. And it's a, you know, for a lot of people it's a throw with it. It's like, oh, yeah, we'll do that whenever. Okay? Problem is, you know, the guy tweaks his hamstring, he may be back next week. The guy gets a concussion, he, he's, he might be down for a couple weeks. But we're not going to take a hamstring workout on a workout. But we're going to throw away neck exercise. So that's something that we should really focus on as strength coaches. We can make the neck stronger, make it more able to resist the rotation. You're going to have a better chance at least. And right now, uh, we, we'll do some manual ex exercises now on our way over here. And we've got linemen that if I wanted to, I could snap their neck and there's nothing they can do about it. You, you think about it, as you're doing you're like, this guy can squat 600 pounds and I can turn his head all the way around and he can't stop. How is it his entire body is so strong, but his neck is as weak as it can be? Okay, you go look on the thing, he's had four concussions over the years. That's something I think that we can work on. We've got manual resistance exercises. Like I said, you've got to use your players for that. Because if you try to do it all yourself, um, you're going to miss the entire workout. You won't see anybody live. But if you can teach the players how to do it properly, then that's something where it's awesome. We use a lot of neck harnesses. I like the neck harnesses because you can do a couple things with them. Um, the Halo machine, I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Uh, it's been out a couple of years. It requires some work to get it all situated, but uh, we, we've seen a study that the Air Force did with fighter pilots while they were training. And the, the, the amount of force that those guys have on their head, with their whole body being strapped in, with their head is all that can move. Um, the improvements they had in neck strength using this thing um, prompted us to go buy a few. <coughs> We're just introducing it into our program right now. And I like it. Uh, it's a little time consuming, but it's not, it's not a bad exercise. Keith. Yes. I would help your player respond to that. They like the idea of it, but because it takes a little time to get it on, um, they, they want to throw it away and go do something else. But they've redesigned it to where now there's a chin strap that just snaps. And so keeping it on the head is a lot easier now. Now, if you can get it situated on your head, it's a heck of a workout. Yeah. Like, you almost feel like your, your neck's been put in traction by a chiropractor a little bit when you finish. I, I use it a lot. I, I like it. Um, but again, getting the players used to it <coughs> is the thing. Machines, uh, there's some good neck machines out there. Uh, 
my, my issue with neck cheek is that you kind of only move your head certain ways, and in sports that just doesn't happen. And there's, there's so much movement going on, and you've got this helmet on. Uh, but there's a lot of things that we can do with strength coaches, particularly in sports that do have high rates of concussions. There's something we can do about it. And uh, I, I think you know, we need to press upon ourselves and need to try. Like I said, we're not going to throw any hamstring exercises. We should throw away this evening. Okay. How do you address rotational exercises in the next? What's that? How do you address rotational exercises? Uh, we do a lot of those. Well, the halo is all rotational. Yeah. And then uh, we do uh, with the manual, put it on the side and just give resistance both ways. And then they'll do it lying and seated. And then we'll do diagonals. So I'm going to try to hit every range of motion as best we can. Try to go from like from your nose from your shoulder up. Just try to engage all muscles. And you're going to hit the chin. Just on the on the side, we get the towers, and I try to put my hand across the whole you know, jaw and you know, give resistance the whole way. And if they're seated, I'll put my hand on their opposite shoulder to make sure they're not using that shoulder to try to twist their head because a lot of time, you know. You're stronger than their neck. Is. So I'll put pressure on their opposite shoulder and make sure that they're getting and fight with resistance both ways. Um, with injuries, you know, lots of times overuse injuries come into play and overtraining comes into play. And what I've seen over the years, and these are kind of the, oh, let's go back. these are kind of the four areas: hamstrings, groin, low back, and shoulders that you just have chronic injuries over the course of the season, over the course of an all-season training program. And lots of times, you know, people just break down. They get tired, they get fatigued, and we don't know it. We say, okay, you're six weeks in, you're fine. No, they're not. You know, the, the amount of stuff you're doing, you know, may be having a different effect on them than you think it does. And a lot of people, you know, like you said, if you tell somebody they want to do two miles, the next person wants to do three. Everyone wants to do more, 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 more. Well, more's, more's not always better. It's just more, and most of the time it's not good for you. So, you know, if, if somebody's fatigued, you say, "Oh, they're out of shape. We need to run more." Well, maybe you need to run less, and maybe you need to rest a little bit. And so, you know, overtraining, overuse injuries—that's something that we as coaches we can control. That you know, we can make sure that we put a deload week or an off week into a program. That might drive some of your coaches crazy. I know we had an, we've had some offensive line coaches over the years that if we said, hey, we're not going to lift real hard this week, we're going to back off, they may have an anger. They may absolutely have an anger as they're standing in front of them. Well, no, 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 because so-and-so school, they're, they don't take deload weeks. Yeah, they do. They do. If they're so good and that's the standard you're going to hold everybody to, yeah, they do. You don't know that, but they do. So this, this is a great article on the effects of overtraining. It was done in Memphis. Um, but basically, to, to kind of summarize it, they tested some guys. They trained some guys. Guys got better. Then when they hit the point of overtraining, okay, they dropped off so much. When they stopped, it, it took them six weeks to get back to where they had initially started. Okay, so once the overtraining effect takes effect, it takes weeks just to get back to where you start. Okay, so again, as people that are in, in charge of the weight rooms, this is something that we can manage. Okay, we can keep this from happening. You know, if we're just beating them down all the time, and I'm, I'm an effort guy, so I'm all for going, going, going. But you can tell when this starts to happen. You'll see performance drop off. You'll see guys get sick. They won't be able to sleep. They'll start losing weight. Like, well, what's wrong with you? You're not working hard. Let's do more. That's not the answer. It's not always the answer. And so this is probably one of the most overlooked aspects of training. You actually get better, not when you're training, when you're resting. And so and a lot of people have a problem with that. We're in sports and we're dealing with competitive people who want to work and work and work. And sometimes you, it, it's hard to tell them, you need to stop. You need to back off a little bit. Because if you, you just, your 
you're running yourself into the ground. And so having a rest period between your workouts on a daily and weekly basis, it's important. Uh, right now, we go on Monday through Thursday training program, and you know we tell ourselves so they can get three days off. The reality of it is they may not come if we have one on Friday. So we move to Thursday to make sure they come. But one of the benefits is they get three days to rest, and hopefully they use it that way. But there's a lot of different things that you can do to help the process of recovery. And like I said, that's when you get better. Proper rest, nutrition, hydration, you know, massages, using foam rollers and things like that. Hot tubs, cold tubs. If you have access to these things, <coughs> they're great contrast baths. If it's something you don't have access to, you know, buy an Epsom salts at the grocery store and put them in a bathtub. Uh, I used to think my grandma was nuts. Like, what is this box of Epsom salts at her house? And as I started looking into it and, and doing it, you know, it's, a, it, it's something that will help you feel better. It really is. And it's something that, that, that people can do. You don't have to have a fancy hydro room like a lot of places that we have you know, to do this. But it's something that the players can do. Sleeping properly. It's amazing how much sleep can have an effect on not only physical skills, but on your mental skills. Um, I have a dollar app on my phone called Sleep Cycle that I lay on my bed when I sleep and when I wake up. Yeah, I know how I feel, but it tells me when I woke up, how many times I woke up, how I actually slept throughout the course of the night. And we went and got these big fancy things to give to our players that cost a lot of money. I got a dollar app that tells me that it's just about dead on every morning when I wake up. Tells me how long I was in bed, how long I actually went to sleep, you know, how long I was actually asleep, and how much of that was good sleep. Cost a dollar. And I look at it and go, the bad thing is I feel like it's judging, like every day. Oh, 68%. Shouldn't drink so many beers last night. You know? <laughs> but it's, you know, it, it's something like I said, it's a dollar. But, and in a way, it's kind of telling you something you already know, but from a feedback standpoint, you can say, you know what? Man, the last six days, I've only got five and a half, six hours of sleep every night. This is something that I need to look at for myself so I can be better as a coach. And you know, we've got our players on a, on a program now, like I said, these large sleep monitors, that hopefully that's something that they can build into their program. And then again, like I said, because we're in charge of the program, programming in the load weeks, like Coach was saying, it's a long season, and even in the off season. You, know, you start pounding yourself, you need, you, know, you need those weekly weeks and those off weeks. I was in a cycle last summer, right when the season started. I went in one day and I was benching and 225 felt like a Mack truck. And I went over to my book and I looked, man, this is 13 weeks in a row. I stripped the bar down and went and got in the cold. Take a week off. You can't do it because your body just can't continue to do it. And then from a medical standpoint, from a safety standpoint, more to do with just injuries, there's a lot of things, and many of you probably already have to do these things, but these are things that we can do that we can make a difference in people's lives. Uh, hydration, you know, keeping guys from getting heat cramps, heat strokes, and things like that, and making sure they're hydrated. Uh, we've got a, a thing we use now that measures urine-specific gravity, <coughs> and it's just a it's just a little pin that you put in a cup and measure the hydration level. And this is one of the things that we've actually done here recently that I think is having a big impact on our team, is to watch where they were week one and what their hydration levels were. And some of them were dangerously bad. And now, over the course of the last two months, to see those hydration levels get better as they've been trained. Okay, and this is something that I think a pin costs two, three hundred dollars. So as far as like <clears throat> letting up, suppose you're in a second where 90% of kids are doing great and there's like two or three that have hit a wall. You know the kids that have trained really hard. I mean, I mean it may be simple tell them to lighten up. Is there something specific you do to adjust their training so that it's not, not a lack of effort, it's almost maybe they got too much going on? Oh, sure. I know personally that, that you should take those guys and, and back them down. Maybe they do a week where it's all, you know, dynamic effort stuff or speed stuff, but they're just, you know, they're not going to go six sets of two heavy on clean. Maybe they back it down and they're going 
three sets of three at 50 percent. So they can get the movement, they're working the movement, but they're not under the same load. And that's something that you can work on on an individual basis, because not, not everyone's the same. Right? And they're they're really competitive, they don't want to do no, that. They don't want to. It's just, you got to sell it. You know, there's, a, there's a lot of them that you have to, we got guys on our team now that if they can bench press every day of the week, they would. And, and they tell you that they would get better every day. And they don't know that they wouldn't, but you have to tell them. Staff CPR certifications. You know, this is something that can, that can you know, be, a, be a big difference in, in somebody's lives. I know in a lot of colleges it's mandatory now. You know? uh, but at high school it, it may or may not be. And if this is something, if you're a place where it's not, make it mandatory. Make it mandatory for you and your, state, your staff to, to be you know, CPR certified. And with that comes certification in the AED. Um, again, this is something that may not matter unless you don't have it. Story with these is that you know, a couple years ago we had a couple of our trainers that were working uh, with soccer. They were coming back from our soccer facility. They're in their van, and one of the stadium workers was walking across the street, had a heart attack, and dropped in the crosswalk. And these two girls got out, <coughs> cut his shirt off, slapped an AED on him, and saved his life. And it's like, wow, and so, you know, this $500 piece of equipment they happen to have with them. With them save the man's life. And so if that's something that you know you have to take out of your budget to put on the way room wall, do it. Because I promise you, you can go your whole life and never use one, that's a, that's a pretty good deal. Because you don't want to have a hat. So, you know, trainers have it, you see to it if you're if you're at school and, and they don't have it, you know, go to your AD and say, look, we need it. We need it, because it, it it'll matter if we don't. And then have an emergency action plan. You know, people think that this isn't a big deal. It is a big deal. If something happens that's bad, people need to know what to do. Okay? You, you know, you need to know that these people are going to get the trains. These people are calling 911. These people are going outside to meet the ambulance. You know, these people are going to get the AED. And that's something that, that will make a difference. A couple years ago in Missouri, uh, they had finished their running, and they had a kid that was sick or so. And he kind of collapsed, and the trainers had already left. So the coaches and the players loaded the kid up on a golf cart or whatever that they had at the stadium. And they took him back to the trainer, which was a, was a way of the way. The kid passed away. They didn't realize that they drove past the trauma center on the way back to the trainer. Yeah. And then no fault of their own. Can you explain that equation right up there, please? That's, that's high level math right there, and I don't want to. 
Again, I know I'm last, and thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it.